interesting here in that we're hybrid. We have a few folks um, in the room. Um, and I'd really like to encourage you uh, to come to the room. Of course, uh, if you're comfortable as we continue these lectures, I think as all of you remember from the dim dark days, uh, it's a lot more pleasant as a speaker to speak to a group uh, here in a room where, where you can see everyone. So Andrea uh, is our guinea pig, maybe not uh, by choice on her part, or ours, uh, but um, appreciate your willingness to, to give the lecture um, under these transitional conditions. Um, Andrea uh, was, uh, she's a California kid. I grew up in California, so I have to kid her a little bit. Uh, born, uh, born in Escondido, Escondido and, and, and spent uh, her, childhood her childhood through, through college, college there. there. She did a uh, BA in, in biology from Pomona College and then a PhD in molecular and cellular biology uh, from UCD. Went on to do uh, post her postdoc training in the Department of Genetics at Stanford. Uh, and during the period at Stanford, she received two prizes, the John Gordon Prize and the Hilda Mangold uh, postdoctoral prizes for the outstanding work that she did there. Uh, after that, uh, she jumped right up here to the very far north um, to experience dark winters and actual rain. She, of course, didn't know what rain was, being a mostly Southern California before she came up here and has, um, has got to enjoy our uh, cold and chilly winters uh, since, since 2015. Um, a major goal, as, as Andrea said in, in uh, the introduction to her talk that she said of regenerative medicine is to improve health outcomes for patients that experience traumatic injuries, such as limb loss and spinal cord injury by promoting uh, regenerative healing. Um, Dr. Wells focuses on defining the mechanisms the first couple injury to regeneration uh, rather than scarring. She and her group exploit the stage specific regenerative competence of the frog Xenopus tropicalis. Uh, a model that can fully regenerate lost spinal cord or limb tissue early in development, but loses that capability of uh, metamorphosis. The stage-specific regenerative competence of, of the frog affords them a unique opportunity to directly compare regenerative to non-regenerative structures uh, within a single organism. Their work focuses on the proximal molecular responses that initiate regeneration uh, chromatin remodeling, transcriptional changes, and the mobilization of metabolic resources for tissue growth. Uh, today, the title of her talk is Decoding the Molecular Requirements for Complex Tissue Regeneration. Andrea, I'll, I'll exit this way as I put my mask on. Stay six feet apart. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and thank you so much, John, for that kind introduction. Uh, can, can you hear me okay? All right, fantastic. So, so as, as John uh, introduced really beautifully, I'm, I'm going to be telling you about regeneration today. But before I get started on that, what I would like to have you do is, is join me in, in thinking about all of the cell types and tissue types that you have acting right now in your body. So, for example, you've got... Uh, these beautiful fibroblasts, which have these really fantastic actinomycin-rich protrusions that link them to each other. You have loose kind of squishy mesenchymal cells like these hepatoblasts that make up your liver. Um, of course, we know in our central nervous system and then also in our peripheral nerves, we have uh, neurons that have you know, gorgeous, really tubulin rich, long, long axons that are able to send signals. Um, we also have highly polarized cells. This is a keratinocyte, one of the cells that makes up our skin. It's really different at the two different ends of the cell. Um, we also have, have fibroblasts that can exist in quite different forms. So these are fibroblasts, these are fibroblasts. You can see that their organization is different. Um, here we're also using actinomycin like we do in the fibroblasts, but here we're using it in our, in our muscle cells to make these long, actually multinucleated cells. Around our blood vessels, we have endothelial cells that make up the walls of our blood vessels. And then within our blood vessels, we have even really highly derived things like, like red blood cells, which, which are so, so changed that they've actually ejected their nucleus and most of their organelles in order to take on their function, which is mostly just to transport around oxygen. And even though all of these cells look so different and act so differently and interact with their neighbors so differently, they all arise through differential utilization of the same genome. And that genome arose at the, at the very beginning of the embryonic life through fertilization of the zygote. So how do we, so what we're fascinated by is how do we use the same genome in order to give all of these different cellular morphologies and outcomes. 
So in my lab, we're really interested in two complementary questions. We're interested in understanding how does an organism make all of these differential, different tissues, different differentiated tissues that make up a body from the genome that's established in the zygote. So, you know, here we've got all these skeletal elements, the different muscle groups, the skin, of course. And then if there's a major injury, like an injury to the spinal cord, how can we use that genome and the properties of growth and differentiation that existed in the embryo to heal, replace, and repair all of those tissues through the process of regeneration? So as you and I are well aware, humans are not a great model for this, right? If we encounter a major injury to our spinal cord, we are in trouble. And that makes this not only a biological question, but also a human health problem, because for many injuries that are encountered in young adults, they can be devastating and they can be devastating over you know, multiple decades because they occur in otherwise healthy individuals. So for example, if we consider spinal cord injuries, just in our own country, there are about a quarter of a million people that are living with a major spinal cord injury. And every year that costs the patient you know, several tens of thousands of dollars, which means over the course of their lifetime, that can have a cumulative cost of millions of dollars considered just in the dollar value of, of care for the patient and, and not even considering the tremendous and devastating uh, consequences for, for quality of life on that patient. But for a spinal cord injury, even just a very small improvement in the degree of innervation or healing can really have a, a drastic positive effect on quality of life and the outcome for the patient. And so that to us represents an opportunity. If we can just elicit a little bit better of an outcome, then that's a great quality of life and cost benefit for human health. And so in order to understand what would underlie and enable regeneration, we of course need a, a model system in which we can study regeneration. And we know that humans are, are not great. And so that's why we use the frog. So this is Xenopus. This actually is a Xenopus tropicalis, which is the species that I'll be talking about today. It's been called the stalwart frog, and it's been used for so many of the transformative, transformative discoveries that all, all of medicine relies on. So I, I put up just a few of the highlights that are pertinent to things I'm going to talk about today. So, so for example, it's from studies in frog muscle that we know many of the fundamental co uh, components of um, both gluconeogenesis and uh, glycolysis um, from work by Meyerhoff and also work later uh, from, there they are, from, uh, from Gerda Corey. And then much of what we know about basic neuroscience and neurobiology also was done in the frogs. So, uh, you know, fundamental properties of how nerve conductance is executed, what the vagus nerve is and how it works, how single ion channels work, all originated in, in work that was done in, in, in frogs. And then sort of most pertinent to the way that we think about the world, um, in 2012, the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine was awarded to John Gurdon who was the first to demonstrate that, the, that, the, that a somatic nucleus, so a frog nucleus from the skin, could be reprogrammed in order to give rise to all of those tissues that we talked about at the beginning of the talk. It's okay, you can come in. And, um, and so because of John Gurdon's work, we know that each cell in the body is, is able to be reprogrammed and give rise to new tissues under the right circumstances. And that's the sort of, um, capability that we're excited to elicit by better understanding regeneration. So just to illustrate some of the things that Xenopus is good for, uh, considered as a, re as a model for regenerative biology, these are a number of structures um, and pictures showing some of the things that can regenerate. A number of these pictures were taken in my lab. So for example, uh, you can, as a tadpole, the, the tadpole can regenerate its central nervous system shown here in green, as well as the peripheral nerves. Um, throughout the entire life of the frog, it retains the ability to regenerate the optic nerve shown here in GFP. Um, as a tadpole, it has the ability to, to, to regenerate well from injuries to the heart, so to the cardiac muscle. Um, and then what we're going to be talking about mostly today is regeneration in the complex appendage of the tail. Um, and then other complex appendages like the developing limbs are also regenerative in the early stages. So this is showing you one skeletal element in the developing hind limb. If you, if you make a truncating injury on that hind limb, then you can get all of those skeletal elements back. But as John mentioned in his introduction, what's especially useful about Xenobis as a model system for regeneration is that it can't always regenerate. So as a tadpole, um, all of those structures that I just showed you are able to regenerate. But as the tadpole goes through the metamorphic crisis and becomes a, frog, a, a froglet, most of those regenerative capabilities are lost. So that is very useful because many of the systems that we use to study regeneration, 
uh, salamanders, you might know the axolotl um, or, or fish, retain their, their regenerative capabilities throughout their entire lifetime, but frogs lose that capability while still maintaining their underlying cell biology and their underlying genome. And that gives us an opportunity to directly compare a regenerative to non-regenerative organism without changing anything else about the organism. And so just to kind of illustrate that, I'll show you. So this is a truncation injury that's done at the ankle joint in a tadpole just a little bit younger than this one. And so at this stage, you can see if you truncate off the developing hind limb, then over the course of a few weeks, it will develop a fully articulated um, uh, uh, limb again. But if you do the same kind of injury, making the truncation at the, at the hind limb, right at the ankle joint at this stage, now you'll get back, you know, you might get back some bone, you might get back some skin, but most of the patterning of that limb has been lost. And so that's one illustration of, of the loss of regenerative competence. And I'll show you a few more as we go on. So today in my talk, the model that I'm going to be um, focusing on principally is the tadpole tail. We like the tail as a model for regeneration because it's, it's high throughput and it's really fast. So one of the nice things about Xenopus is that you can get you know, certainly hundreds and often thousands of them in one clutch. So you have the opportunity to do the same experiment in many, many animals. These tail truncations that we do take literally seconds, it's maybe two to three seconds per animal. And within this tail, we have a number of structures that we're interested in. So you have the central nervous system, you have the spinal cord, you have the overlying muscle, you have the underlying notochord, which is a source of important signals for regenerating the central nervous system. You have the skin, all the cell types of the skin, and you have the vasculature. And so you have multiple different cell types all integrated and patterned in three dimensions. So it's really a complete appendage. And, and the regeneration is really fast. So the time scale I've shown you here, you go from, from uh, no tail at all to a nicely patterned new tail in just about three days. And so in my lab, we're interested in many aspects of regeneration. We're interested in understanding the cellular stress responses that are kicked off by injury that will eventually allow us to, to initiate regeneration. We're interested in the um, cell metabolic properties that will enable regeneration. We're very, We're very interested, interested in the, in the underlying, underlying uh, organization, organization of chromatin, chromatin that allows you to express different genes at different times in different cell types as regeneration progresses. And then we're interested in the contribution and regulation of cell type specific uh, stem and progenitor cells. And so this is too many things to talk about in one talk. And so today what I'm gonna be sharing are um, three stories, but in two themes. So I'm first gonna be telling you a story about transcriptional remodeling in the progenitor cells of the central nervous system, some neural progenitor cells. And then I'll tell you, uh, so this is a, a published story. And then I'll tell you a recently published story about um, the role that we think nutrient sensing plays in regeneration, and then uh, a quick sort of new emerging story that's not yet published, uh, looking at, at metabolic reprogramming in the regenerating tadpole. So let's talk first about stem cells. So you know we're interested in, in comparing and contrasting how an organism can make differentiated tissues with how it would replace those differentiated tissues. And the thing is, we know really quite a lot about common processes between these two. Um, you know, biological events. So in both cases, we've got tissue that has to be differentiated. We have cells that have to proliferate either to make the tadpole in the first place or to replace all this, the tissue that was lost. And then we know that, um, that all of those tissues as they're grown out need to be properly patterned and integrated. We also know, interesting, sorry. We also know that there are a number of common signaling pathways that are used in both, in both development and regeneration. So in both cases, we need to make use of WINT and FGF and BMP and notch signaling, sonic hedgehog signaling and hippo signaling, which regulates growth, um, Hox genes, which regulate positional identity. All of these have been deeply studied in development. They're important to get in regeneration. But there are also some important differences. So if we consider, for example, the development of the nervous system in the young embryo, we have this really beautifully articulated sort of lineage and progression of how you get from a pluripotent stem cell to a lineage restricted neural stem cell to a fate restricted neural progenitor and how you'll finally differentiate that progenitor into a neuron. We know those steps really well. We can recapitulate them you know, in vitro. We can do it with stem cells in a dish and get neurons that fire, which is awesome. 
in the context of regeneration, we're in a position where we can't really neatly recapitulate those embryonic events because when we cut the tail off, there's a mixture already of differentiated neurons and also of stem cells and progenitor cells that are different stages of this differentiation process. So after the tadpole encounters a major injury to its spinal cord, what do all of those cells do? So what's the fate of the, the, the progenitor, progenitor cells, cells that are there and what are the fates of the neurons that are there? And those underlying questions are what motivated uh, graduate student Monica Kekabin, who recently graduated, and also Alex Chitsazan, who was our uh, bioinformaticist working on this, to really want to look deeply at neuroprogenitors. And in particular, the question that Annika focused on was trying to understand how neuroprogenitors are going to decide between two fate decisions that they have to make over the course of regeneration. So if you've got neuroprogenitors and you have an injured spinal cord, at some point those progenitors are going to need to proliferate in order to replace all the tissue of the spinal cord. But also they're also going to need to differentiate in order to give you functional neurons. And so how do the progenitors decide which of those things they're going to do? Which, pro which of those two processes um, are prioritized first? What are the genes that they express as they make those decisions? And what are the regulators, the transcriptional regulators of those decisions? And so to make to address this question, Annika made use of a transgenic tadpole. So this is a tadpole that's expressing GFP in its neuroprogenitor cells under the control of the neuroprogenitor specific marker PAC6. And so this is a, a cross section now. So we've cut the tadpole right here at the line and we're looking at a cross section of the spinal cord. And here you can see the GFP, which is mostly, a, or, right, right, mostly expressed, expressed around, around the center, center of the spinal cord canal. And I'll point out, so this is a DAPI stain. stain so DAPI staining stain every, every nucleus in the spinal cord. cord. The, you can see there's only maybe 20 or 30 cells here. So this is a tiny, tiny little spinal cord, but nevertheless, it's got many of the same organizational principles as the mammalian spinal cord. And in particular, its progenitor cells are located in the middle. So this is SOX2, a marker for neural stem cells, largely overlapping with the GFP domain. And then its differentiated neurons are out around the periphery. So this is two different stains for differentiated neurons that you can see are mostly around the outside, far away from the progenitor domain. So we were interested in understanding the, the transcriptional regulation and the differential expression of genes that goes into these um, fate choices within the neural progenitors. And so to do that, we wanted to look at how injury signals were being interpreted at the chromatin level in neural progenitors. So if there's an injury, um, so that's our little like red lightning bolt here. So if there's an injury to the tadpole, that's gonna cause immediate changes in things like uh, the, the membrane potential of the injured cells. It's gonna cause localized inflammation and, and release of lots of reactive oxygen species. And all of those short, ter short term and short distance signals have to be interpreted in some way by the cells to tell them that an injury has happened. So what we're gonna get are some transcription factors that will be mobilized to go in and bind different regions in the chromatin and turn new genes on and turn old genes off. And so what we would like to know are what are the genes that are being bound by those transcription factors and what are the genes that are, what are the transcription factors that are doing the binding? And we can get information about both of those simultaneously by querying chromatin accessibility. And so what we're going to do is interrogate chromatin accessibility and occupancy in the chromatin of those neural progenitors to understand how those changes are enabling regenerative, regenerative signaling, signaling and growth. And growth. So, so to, to do, do that, that Annika made, made use of her transgenic tadpoles and she would cut the tail off and then she would either collect the tissue that was immediately proximal to that injury plane right at the zero hours post amputation time point, so right after injury, or she would let them grow back for six or 24 or 72 hours until we have a pretty complete tail. She would collect up all of this tissue and she would disaggregate it, so she would take it all apart enzymatically, and then she would use flow cytometry to collect the GFP expressing cells. So those GFP expressing cells, remember, are our neural progenitors. And then she could use an assay for transposase accessible chromatin, which shows us just the open chromatin. And that shows us what are the promoters that are gaining accessibility? What are the genes that are being turned on at different time points across our regenerative time course? So Annika is now analyzing chromatin accessibility at each of these time points. The first thing that she did was just look at what are the promoters that are uniquely accessible in neuroprogenitors 
relative to all of the rest of the tissues that's in the tadpole, just to make sure that this is an assay that was going to be useful and informative. And so she saw that promoters that were uniquely accessible in neuroprogenitors are enriched for things like neurogenesis and nervous system development and neuron differentiation. And that was very reassuring because they're supposed to be neuroprogenitors. And so now we know that's what we got and that we're seeing um, the, the profile of, of gene expression that we ought to and chromatin accessibility that we ought to in neuroprogenitors. So now she can look how that profile changes over time within the progenitors and ask these questions, what's prioritized first and what are the genes that are expressed? So what you're looking at here now is a heat map and what you're looking at are the, the yellow regions here are promoters that are more accessible and the blue ones are less accessible promoters. And what we're contrasting are the yellow neuroprogenitor cells from, um, from six hours post-amputation to those at 24 hours post-amputation. So this is telling us what kind of genes are turning on in that the first day after amputation. And all of these open promoters, all of these highly accessible promoters, Annika found were associated with things like neuronal transport, so a lot of neurotransmitters in this clade, and also neuron differentiation which is kind of surprising. Um, so what we were seeing was an early emphasis on neuronal differentiation, not so much on proliferation or the early embryonic development, which you might have expected to see if you were recapitulating embryonic events. And then if we looked later at 72 hours, so now we're looking just at the promoters that are accessible three days after amputation, this is where we saw an upregulation of things like cell proliferation and early nervous system development, and also Wnt signaling, which is an important signaling pathway early in development. So this was exciting and kind of curious to us, and, and it suggested a hypothesis, which is that perhaps what we have is some of our neural progenitors differentiating early um, and giving us, you know, all of these neuronal differentiation terms that we saw in the first day, and that maybe it's not until three days after amputation, late in the in the regenerative process, that we're getting a priority on proliferation. Okay, so that's our hypothesis. If it were true, we should be able to see this reflected um, in the sort of changing cell type composition within the spinal cord. And an easy way to interrogate that was to make use of single cell RNA sequencing. So, so you haven't have seen one of these plots, plots before, each cell, each dot here represents, represents a cell, and cells that have a similar transcriptional profile are grouped together, and then you compare that transcriptional profile to cell types that you know to assign what those cell types are. So what we've done here is just amputated off the whole tail and then taken it apart and assign, assigned cell identities to every single cell inside the tail. So some of these are, are neural cells, but some of them are also things like notochord cells or you know, muscle cells, we've got skeletal muscle cells here. We have also skin cells and vascular cells, all of the different cell types that you'd expect to find in the tail. But among those are seven, seven different cell types that are neural. And those are the ones that we're gonna look at more closely. So those are, that's our sort of super clade of, of neural cell types. And if we break these down, it includes our neural progenitor cells, which are our, our prolifer proliferative uh, PAC6 positive cells. These will then differentiate. And then after differentiating, they can become any of several different neuronal types. And what we saw was that in the, in the pre-injury spinal cord, when we look at the neural cell type composition, almost half of them are, are neural progenitors. And if we include the differentiating ones, more than half of them fall into one of those two groups. And a little bit less than half are differentiated neurons. But if we look at that 24 hour time point where we were seeing that early priority on, on differentiation, we saw that now the proportion of neural progenitors has really dropped. And instead what we've gotten is an expansion of neuronal subtypes, differentiated neuronal subtypes, especially this one subtype which expresses the leptin receptor. And that's now become very interesting to us. So that was an agreement with our hypothesis that we're taking the neural progenitor pool and depleting it. And those, some of those progenitors are going through cell cycle accident and differentiation. What we can also do is assign the cell cycle state. So, um, so if we look at the neural progenitor population in the uninjured tadpole, we could see that, again, about half of these cells are in the SG2M phases of the cell cycle. So that means the, the mitotic or the synthesis parts of the cell cycle. But if we go to that one day after, after amputation time point, now about three quarters of the cells are actually in the G1, the non-mitotic phases of the cell cycle, and only in only about a quarter of the cells are in the cycling phases of the cell cycle. So that also agrees with the idea that we've got cell cycle exit and some of these progenitors are exiting. 
We can see also too that we don't really see much proliferation in the spinal cord until 72 hours. This is just a stain from mitotic cells. So the purple cells here are mitotic and the green are the progenitors. At 24 hours post amputation, there's very, very few mitotic cells found within the spinal cord, but by 72 hours, that proportion increases. And so altogether, what this is telling us is that um, in the regenerating spinal cord, there's actually a really early emphasis on, differ on differentiation and um, and specifically differentiation into these leptin positive uh, neurons. We know that because we can see the, um, the priority on differentiation in our chromatin accessibility assay, we can see a reduction in the progenitor pool. We can see that there's a gain of these neurons and we can see that there's a loss of actively cycling cells. And it's not until three days after amputation, late in regeneration, where the, the animals really turned its attention to proliferation and replacing all of that last tissue. Okay, so that answers two of our questions. Which, prior, which process is prioritized first? It appears to be uh, the, the differentiation. And then also, what are the genes that are expressed? We've done all this single cell RNA-seq. We now know a number of the genes that are being turned on. And this now gives us the opportunity to ask what's regulating those decisions. So happily, we didn't have to do any new experiments here. We could just go back to the chromatin accessibility assays we'd already done. Because whenever we look at a region of chromatin that's gained accessibility, we can look at the sequence that is contained within that region and see what kind of transcription factor binding sites it's enriched for. And if we do this with many thousands of regions that are gaining accessibility, then we can see an enrichment, a statistical enrichment for particular transcription factor binding sites. And then we can go look at those transcription factors and see if they're important. And so this let us, let us discover a number of potential regulators of, um, of spinal cord regeneration that were not previously known. And the two in particular that I'm going to introduce to you are MACE1 and PBX3. So these are the kinds of sequences that MACE1 and PBX3 like to bind to. They're quite similar. And indeed, many of the regions that they bound to, we predicted, could be bound by both factors. Um, you know, if, if, you were, if you were looking for a transcription factor that's important for regeneration, you'd like it to actually be expressed uh, at the time and in the place that you're studying, and you would like to see it increase in expression as you're going through regeneration. And both of these factors have that quality. So um, this is our single cell RNA-seq data showing that they're highly expressed in the motor neurons after injury. And then these are in situ hybridizations. This dark blue uh, that you see is, is just a stain for where the RNA is. And you can see it's found in the spinal cord for both genes. And, you know, especially you can see it with PBX3 here, very highly expressed after injury. So they're in the right place, they're at the right time to have something to do with regeneration. And then, you know, the next question, of course, is do they matter? So now what we would like to do is a functional experiment, deplete the tadpole of these factors and find out whether regeneration fails. So what I'm showing you here are, um, are stains for neural filaments. And so what I hope you can see is that um, in our injured tadpole, uh, in, a, in the normal case, if we're just using a control tadpole, you can see that there are these really nice long axons that come out at regular intervals all along the tadpole tail. And after we make an injury and we let it grow back for three days, you can see that there's this really nice organization of all of those axons afterward. What, we've, what we then did was we made use of um, translation blocking, they're called morpholino oligonucleotides, they are body soluble, and we could make them to prevent translation either of PBX3 or MACE1, our two transcription factors, and then we could just inject them into the tail vein at these uh, tadpole stages and find out what happens if we deplete either factor. And when we did this, what we found was that you know, our tadpoles, they, they look fine because we let them grow up to tadpole stages before they did this. But as soon as we injected in these translation blocking morpholinos, the organization of the central nervous system and especially of the outgrowing axons became really disrupted. And so especially you can see by three days after amputation, all of the axons are really disrupted. And in consequence, the tadpole doesn't regenerate as well. So over here, we're looking at the length of the regenerated spinal cord. So there's our spinal cord length in the, in the control animal, and it's reduced either in our PBX3 or our MACE1 um, uh, depleted animals. And then not just the length of the spinal cord, but actually the length of the entire tail was reduced um, if we depleted either of these factors. 
And so I'll summarize this sort of first half of the talk by saying, you know, we, we think we've sort of uncovered a new paradigm for spinal cord regeneration, in, in which, which is actually, actually a really early requirement for differentiation. Um, this actually agrees with many things that have been described before, showing that you need to have nerve conductance in order for the surrounding tissues to regrow well. And so we think that this early priority on, on differentiation helps establish the neurons that can conduct those impulses. And we think that MACE1 and PBX3 are important transcription factors regulating those decisions. And so now I'm going to change gears and I'm going to start talking about metabolism. So let's come back to the different things we're interested in. The next story I'm going to tell you is a story about nutrient sensing, and it has to do with um, how a tadpole knows whether it has enough fuel in order to make all of the cells it would need in order to regrow. Okay, the work that I'm going to share with you uh, was done in part by G. Patel, who's in the audience. Um, as well as Annika Kakeman, who did the work I showed you before, and Madison Williams, who was an undergrad when she took on most of these projects, um, just a spectacular undergrad, uh, and, and now works in the uh, Miski lab in, um, in South Lake Union, still working with Xenophis tropicalis. So at the beginning of the talk, I told you how um, tadpoles are highly regenerative, but adult frogs aren't. But actually, there's a little bit more to it. There's, there's a couple of different points at which there's a stage-specific loss in regenerative competence. So let's look at that. So we start off with this tadpole, which as I've shown you is highly regenerative. But just a few days later, it goes through this brief window, which is called the refractory period. And there's very minimal regeneration that can happen during the refractory period. About a week after that, it gets its regenerative capabilities back all of a sudden, and it becomes regenerative again. It maintains that regenerative capability through the development of the little limb buds. And then as the tadpole goes through the metamorphic crisis, it loses those regenerative abilities and loses them permanently. So there's two different points here at which we become non-regenerative, both at this early refractory period, later at metamorphosis. So let's look at that refractory period. So, uh, so here we're starting with an uninjured tadpole, and this is the same stage I've been showing you all throughout the talk that we call the stage 41. This is a three day old tadpole. If you cut this tail off and let it grow, now we're letting it grow back for a whole week before I've been showing you three days, but this is a whole week. You can see it's a beautiful tail. You really can't tell that it's ever been through an amputation. And it's about 40% of the length from the vent to the tail tip. If we let the tadpole now get a little bit older before we do the amputation, so now it's one day older, stage 43, it's still a pretty good regenerator. Stage, uh, two days older, stage 45, it starts to be a little bit less good. Stage 46, a little bit less good. And by stage 47, you can see I amputated off this tail, almost no tissue grows back, and the proportion of uh, the, you know, the relative length of that tissue has dropped tremendously. But if I keep this tadpole around for another week, and importantly, if I feed it well, by the time it gets to stage 49, now it's gotten back not only the ability to make a beautiful looking tail, but also the full length of that tail. So we were very curious what this refractory period might be about. And, and it got us thinking about, well, what do you need in order to make you know, all of these cells? You, you need to be able to, to, to get phospholipids so that you can make membranes and you need nucleic acids so that you can make DNA and do cell division. And you need plenty of proteins so that you can do protein synthesis in order just to, to have the raw material on hand to make all these cells out of. And that got us thinking because in addition to the failure to regenerate, we saw that the steady state amount of cell division in these tadpoles drops off considerably as they enter the refractory period. So here, each little green dot is a mitotic cell. It's similar to the purple dots I had shown you before. Um, and at stage 41, there's lots and lots of mitotic dots all throughout the tail. At stage 43, there's still plenty. At stage 45, there start to be a bit fewer. At stage 46, fewer still. And by the time we get to stage 47, even though the tail looks great, almost none of the cells in it are dividing anymore. So that suggests that something important for cell division has run out. So where is the metabolic fuel to build a tail coming from? And so at this point, I need to introduce that for the early stages we've been talking about so far, this is a tadpole that even though it's hatched and can swim around, doesn't eat. So it has no mouth, it cannot eat. So what's it got getting its energy from? In fact, it doesn't have a mouth until about stage 46 here. And by stage 47, when it's not able to regenerate is when it would normally begin really feeding aggressively. Because of this phenomenon of the transition to independent feeding coincided so closely with the loss of regenerative competence, we wondered if a nutrient stress was, was a component of this loss of regeneration. All right, so I told you that the stage 41 tadpole can't eat. Well, where then does it get its energy from? 
And the answer is it gets its energy from maternal yolk stores. So first you know what yolk is, you've seen an egg before, before. It's, it's basically, basically the same, same stuff. stuff. Yolk, yolk has, has, a a has one protein, protein component that's, um, that's in very, very high abundance, and that's called vitelligenin. Vitelligenin makes a structure that's basically a lipophilic basket. So all of these little beta sheets make this lipophilic cavity, and all of the fats will stick to that lipophilic cavity and can now be transported around from place to place. The wonderful thing about Xenopus is that this vitelligenin is found all throughout the egg, and as the cells go through their early cell divisions, each cell gets a portion of that yolk, and that's very useful for early embryonic work because you can like make a little explant, and that explant will grow and, and turn into to, to its own little structure in the dish because it's got a store of yolk. You can do grafting experiments, and each cell comes with some yolk, and so those cells survive pretty well. Um, but as the, with each subsequent cell division and as the cells go through their metabolic processes, they start to exhaust that yolk and run out of the fuel um, to keep development going. And so by the time we reach stage 41, we know that we're probably starting to get low on yolk. And so what we wondered is, as we come into the refractory period, have we now run out of yolk? So we, uh, we asked this question, uh, this is an experiment that Jeet did. This is just a straightforward Western blot. So he just blotted for vitelligenin across these stages as we enter the refractory period. You can see there's just gigantic amounts of vitelligenin in our, in our regenerative stage 41, but very quickly that amount of vitelligenin starts to run out. Um, and especially by the time we get to the refractory period of stage 47, almost no vitelligenin is left. You can see that the place that vitelligenin sticks around in is the somites, that's the embryonic muscle. But by the time we get to stage 47, we're almost out of it. So that suggests that the tadpole is short of nutrients and perhaps um, can tell that it's run out. So this now got us wondering how would the tadpole know whether it has nutrients or not? And one of the things we got to query was mTOR signaling. Um, you almost certainly, whatever you work on, you've almost certainly heard of mTOR signaling. It does a billion things. But among the things it does is detect, is, is serve as a mediator for, for insulin signaling and also for leptin signaling, um, both of which are components of, of uh, nutrient detection. And, and mTOR signaling serves as basically an, an okay to grow signal. So in the presence of mTOR, the cell is getting a cue that it's okay to mobilize nutrients and use them for cell division and growth. And so what we wondered is if we block mTOR signaling, would the cells no longer be getting that mobilization signal? And would they therefore perhaps hold on to their vitelligenin a little longer? So what we did was we just took our tadpoles and we put them in one of two different inhibitors for mTOR signaling. So we blocked mTOR signaling either with rapamycin or taurin. And when we did this, we could see that because they're no longer getting that mobilization cue, they would hang on to their vitelligenin a little bit longer. But since they're not using the vitelligenin to let themselves grow, they ended up a little smaller because they're not growing as well. So our rapamycin treated tadpoles ended up a little shorter than our control treated tadpoles. And that was true both, uh, we'll, go, we'll go through the quantification, but it's, it's statistically significant both for, um, for rapamycin and also for taurin. Okay, so uh, taurin signaling seems to be important for growth. Is it also important for regeneration? So now what we did was we took our tadpoles and we amputated the tail and we would put them again in rapamycin or in taurin. And now we would just measure how long the tails were at, um, at our 72 hour post amputation time point. And we can see if we inhibited tor signaling, now the tails were significantly shorter. And also even more so, um, the amount of mitotic cells that we could see had dropped off significantly, very highly significantly. So it seems that in the context of regeneration also, tor signaling is important. And so then you may be wondering, um, we, we, we did the sort of obvious like moonshot experiment, which is that you know, if, we, if we don't feed our tadpoles well, or if we inhibit their, their tor signaling, they don't regenerate very well. Perhaps if we feed them more, they will regenerate better. And so we just did a simple thing. So we, we contrasted starved to fed tadpoles. So we took them at stage 47 and amputated off their tails and let them grow for a week, either without any feeding or with uh, aggressive feeding every day. And they regenerate so, so much better if you feed them. So in the unfed condition, this is now an even more extreme example of what I showed you before, which is that we amputate off the tail at stage 47, really no growth happens, even by seven days post amputation, almost no regeneration has happened. All, most all of these tadpoles have either poor regeneration or no regeneration at all. But if we feed them really well, then the tadpole grows back qualitatively much better and also quantitatively much better. Okay. So that takes us to this overall so sort of summary, summary where, where as, as the tadpole enters, enters the refractory period, period we, we know and have known that its ability to regenerate declines. 
We know that that coincides with the transition to end-dependent feeding. And we know that, and now we know that that also coincides with an exhaustion of the maternal yolk. And so what we have also been able to add in is that if we feed the tadpole well, that helps the tadpole get through this difficult transition where it's running out of maternal nutrient stores and now can build up enough new nutrient stores in order to get you through regeneration. I do not think that this means that if you encounter, you know, if you if you if you encounter major major injury to your limb or to your spinal cord, that the answer is going to be go and eat a whole bunch. I don't think that that will be enough. But what, but what I, do I do think that it illustrates is that you need to have enough nutrient stores on hand in order to be able to do all of this growth. And so I think that that helps inform the um, bridge between injury and cell growth and how the the, the self signaling paradigms about sensing may be important to cue into your cells that they are that they have permission to grow and divide again. Okay, and that finally brings me now to, uh, to thinking about metabolic reprogramming in the context of regeneration. And so just in the last few minutes here, let's come back to this idea that if you want to rebuild a structure like a tail, you're going to need phospholipids, you're going to need nucleic acids, you're going to need lots of proteins. And so where do you get those from? What's the metabolic paradigm? that enables regenerative growth. One thing that we started thinking about was how in many conditions where cells proliferate really rapidly, like solid tumors, where they go through massive amounts of proliferation on a short time scale, or embryonic stem cells, which are proliferating like crazy, those kinds of cells make use of aerobic glycolysis. And so instead of using their mitochondria to do predominantly oxidative phosphorylation, which is very efficient, they're doing this, this sort of energetically wasteful form of metabolism, which is glycolysis. Um, if you, you, know, you remember from your undergrad classes, this doesn't give you a whole lot of ATP, but if you're working under non-ATP limiting conditions, it's a very quick way to get you precursors for nucleotide biosynthesis and fatty acid biosynthesis. And so that's what tumors and stem cells do in order to get all of the metabolic intermediates that they need for their quick proliferation. We wondered if the same might be true in regeneration. We do, after all, have to do rapid proliferation. So this got us wondering if, if aerobic glycolysis, which is also known as the Warburg effect, might be important in the context of regeneration. So the first way that we queried this, this again was work done by graduate student G. Patel, uh, was to look at glucose uptake. So glucose, of course, is the, is the substrate for all of glycolysis. And what we could do is take a fluorescent version of glucose called 2 nbdd 2 NBDG and inject it directly into the tail vein. And if we let this sit for a little bit, then eventually it will spread to all of the tissues and then we can cut the tail off and ask, do we get more glucose uptake? Do we get more fluorescence in the regenerating tail? And we saw that we did. So when we first put in the, the 2 NBDG and at zero hours after amputation, you can see the main structure that's, that's bright and green here is the, the notochord structure, which is known to be glycolytic, so that's good. Not much fluorescence over here at the amputated site. But if we wait around for a day, we can see over here in the new tissue, in the newly regenerated tissue, there's been a huge amount of glucose uptake. So we thought that was exciting. And furthermore, when we looked at all of the, the expression data that we had, when we looked at our RNA-seq data, we could see that expression for glucose transporters, like this one, SL2, SLC2A3 and SLC2A6, is really spiking as we go through regeneration. And we can see this um, both in our RNA-seq and also when we look by in situ hybridization, you can see there's, this is again, the blue is our expression. There's lots of blue in our regenerating tail. So this was true both for our glucose transporters that are going to get glucose into the cell and also for our hexakinase isoforms, which are what's going to convert glucose into the, through the first step of, of glycolysis into glucose glycolysis. So we were very excited about this and we were like, ah, perhaps glycolysis is indeed the, the main metabolic paradigm of regeneration. And so, you know, so next we did a functional experiment. So if that were true, then if we inhibited glycolysis, that should affect regeneration adversely. So we made use of a different uh, glucose analog, which is uh, 2DG. 2DG goes through the first step of glycolysis just fine, but then it's a competitive inhibitor for the second step. And when we treated the tadpoles with 2DG, then their, their uh, regenerate lengths really fall off, and also they become um, relatively poor at regeneration. So that also supported the idea that you need to be able to do glycolysis in order to regenerate the tail. 
But then we ran into a bit of a hurdle, which is that, okay, our hexapinase isoforms were really strongly expressed during regeneration, and our, our glucose transporters were highly expressed. But you may remember that the glycolysis has 10 steps, and then, then at the end, you actually have to use lactate dehydrogenase um, in order to be able to, to keep around enough NAD to keep it going. And none of the rest of those enzymes were highly expressed in regeneration. In fact, many of them were really down-regulated in regeneration. So that was quite annoying. Uh, and got in, in the way of a beautiful hypothesis, which is that it ought to be that glycolysis is upregulated and, you know, taught us once more that there's nothing like data to ruin a really great hypothesis. Um, and so we had to think of another possible explanation. And, and luckily, you know, the first product of, of glycolysis is glucose 6-phosphate. But once you have that, you don't necessarily have to put it through the rest of glycolysis. There are more things that you can do with that glucose 6-phosphate. And one of them is that you can send them to the pentose phosphate pathway, um, also known as the pentose phosphate shunt. So what you do in the pentose phosphate pathway is you take that glucose 6-phosphate and you use it to make a whole bunch of NADPH and also to make ribulose 5-phosphate. And those two things are very useful because you need NADPH in order to do uh, fatty acid biosynthesis. So if you wanted to make fatty acids to make membranes, that would be useful. And ribulose 5-phosphate, you can turn into ribose 5-phosphate, which sounds uh, very, very much like the progenitor of RNA because it is. So this lets you make nucleotides, which are also very useful if you'd like to do cell division. Okay, so we wondered if perhaps actually what we're doing is taking our glucose 6-phosphate and using it to do the pentose phosphate pathway. And here we were on much better footing because all of the enzymes for the pentose phosphate pathway are highly expressed by RNA-seq after injury. And this is an in situ hybridization for a couple of those. So glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, G6PD, is, does the committing step of the pentose phosphate pathway. We could see that that was quickly upregulated in our regenerating tadpoles. And so is this other enzyme transketolase, TKT. And we also wanted to assay not just the RNA level expression, but also the, the protein uh, activity of these enzymes. And so we, we looked at G G6PD um, enzymatic activity and could see that that went up really high one day after injury, actually just by six hours after injury. So now we were, we were excited uh, because all of this suggested that perhaps um, pentose phosphate activity is where the G6PD is going. And so here again, we did a functional experiment. We've made use of one of two different inhibitors that are specific for um, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, that G6PD. If we inhibit, uh, if, sorry, if we treat either of the, if we treat the tadpoles with either of these inhibitors, then regeneration is less successful. And um, both, you know, in terms of the regenerate length and in terms of the sort of score for how good the tadpole tail tails come up, you can see especially the fins are sensitive to the inhibition of this enzymatic activity. And if we looked at cell division, because of course the hypothesis is that this is important for cell division, if we treat with either of these inhibitors, then the amount of, then the number of mitotic or proliferating cells in the injured tail dropped considerably as well, supporting the hypothesis that you're using this um, pentose phosphate pathway in order to fuel cell proliferation. And so where we've gotten to is we think that um, Increase, increase glucose flux, increase glucose uptake, and then flux specifically into the pentose phosphate pathway are part of what enables re regenerative growth. So we think our tadpoles encounter an injury. In response to that injury, they upregulate expression of their glucose transporters and hexakinase. That gets you from glucose over to glucose 6-phosphate. We think that some amount of this glucose probably does continue to go through glycolysis because if we inhibit them with 2DG, then that has an inverse effect. But we think that the bulk of it goes into the pentose phosphate pathway where it's used to make um, nucleotide precursors like ribose 5-phosphate and also NADPH. And that the presence of these metabolic intermediates enable the proliferation and regeneration together with the nutrient sensing that I talked about before that gives you regenerative growth. It leaves us, of course, many other questions. So we would like to know what the transcription factor is that's interpreting those injury cues and turning on expression of these factors. We've been wondering if it might be the transcription factor HIF1-alpha. Um, we, of course, would like to know what's regulating the, um, con the, the bias in the utilization of glucose 6-phosphate to go through PPP and not through glycolysis. We would very much like to know which or both of these factors that are important for regenerative growth. And then we would like to know how they're integrated with the other signals that are happening in order to give you full regeneration. So those are some of the questions that we're looking forward to studying as we go on. 
And then just kind of a, a last point, we're also very excited, you know, we've been studying this in the whole tail, which as I've told you repeatedly, is many different cell types. We would really like to know, are all cell types doing the same thing, metabolically speaking? And we think that probably they are not. One of the things we think about is that um, if we come back again to the central nervous system, when we look at, um, so this is just a, a different way of looking at our single cell RNA-seq data. So, so cells over here are neural stem cells and they express high levels of SOX2, this is SOX2. Cells over on this end, the yellow ones are neurons and they express low levels of SOX2, high levels of L1 CAM. So this is sort of one way of showing the transition from a neural stem cell to a neuron. When we look at how glycolysis genes are used across this transition, we see that when we look at like hexokinase, for example, but also the other glycolysis genes, it's really only in differentiated neurons that they're very highly expressed. And so we're, we're curious about how this regulation of um, this transition from, from stem cell to differentiated neuron may coincide with a transition in, in metabolic use, um, both in the, the neural lineage, but also in other cell types. So that's a direction we're excited to go next. And so I'll just conclude by, by, you know, hopefully I've made the case by reminding you that the ZFS are, are a really a wonderful system to illuminate transcriptional and, and metabolic reprogramming during vertebrate regeneration. Um, they're a great, great system looking at temporal, temporal dynamics, dynamics the proliferation, proliferation differentiation, especially in the central nervous system. system. They're a beautiful system for identifying new potential regulators of spinal cord regeneration, which we can then begin to, to study in, in non-regenerative systems and eventually move our way toward therapeutics. Um, they're, they're a great and very efficient system for looking at, you know, really an understudied area of regeneration, which is nutrient mobilization and sensing, as well as um, the metabolic paradigms that may favor regenerative growth. And I'll conclude there by thanking you, thank you all for coming. Um, and then also the, the people in my, in my lab who did, uh, did this work and supported this work, the work that I showed today was largely done by G. Patel, uh, by Annika Kekobin, who I showed you before. Uh, oh, there she is. And by uh, Madison Williams. Um, and then we've had wonderful collaborators in the Department of Biochemistry. I did not know hardly anything about metabolism, but we've gotten great help from people like Suzanne Hoppins and also from Jim Hurley, um, Dana Miller's lab, uh, Young Kwan's lab, Lauren Kian's lab. Um, some of our, our frog colleagues have helped us out with reagents along the way, Mark Kirshner, Mr. Pakoka, uh, Clotilde Cath Cathard at, at Berkeley. Um, we use some of the Xenopus specific resources like Zenbase every single day. We've also made good use of the resources here at the department um, at, at UW broadly and in the biochem department. And then um, I'll thank my funders. So the spinal cord work was all funded by a grant from NINDS. And then the work from um, on, on metabolism has been funded um, by programs here at UW, specifically uh, the Research Royalties Fund. Uh, thank you all for listening. And I would be happy to take questions. Um, either on Zoom or from folks in the audience. Oh, we'll give it a minute, I think. I'll start us off. Thanks, Anne. Go ahead. So, in the beginning of the talk, where you're talking about what happens right after amputation, you see the loss of the progenitor pool. So, does that come back at some point, or does that mean that it can't regenerate? as well a second time. Okay, awesome, good question. So Suzanne's question is, is whether, so we, we see that there's this reduction in the progenitor pool. Does that mean that we would eventually get progenitor exhaustion? Does that mean that we, there, that, or does it, does it, is, does, does it recover, recover at some point? point? Um, I, I think, think the answer is that, that it probably recovers, recovers because we do see that conversion to proliferation. So I think that it does eventually build back up. What we haven't done is, is assay in a quantitative way, do you have just as many progenitors in the end as you did at the beginning? Um, Indirectly, I think you probably do because we know that you can amputate the tail off over and over again. And in fact, the tadpole tail, um, as long as you haven't gotten to, to, to one of these refractory periods, the tadpole tail will continue to regenerate. Um, and in fact, if you inhibit thyroid signaling, which is what um, directs uh, metamorphosis, then um, you can keep the, the little tadpole as a tadpole um, and you can keep doing uh, these amputations over and over and over and over and over again. Good question. Oh, okay. And so uh, Rachel Clevett in the in the Q and A asks: Is the effect of yolk loss due to dilution as proliferation occurs, or is the vitelligenin being degraded? If you treat with a proteasome inhibitor, what's the effect? That's an excellent question, Rachel. So um, I don't know for certain. I've been thinking of it kind of as a dilution, but I don't know if there's a degradation. What we expect is that the um, the fats that are moved around by vitelligenin. Um, have been degraded probably through beta oxidation, although we haven't directly 
queried the role of beta oxidation. Um, and what, we what we've not done um, is treat with a proteasome inhibitor. We would have to think carefully about how to do that so that we were getting the answer to what's happening to vitelogenin and not to every other protein that's being turned over, but I think it's still a really interesting question. Okay, let's see. I think I see just the one in the Q and A. I'm going to move over and see if there's any in the chat. Yeah, I see two in the chat. One sec. Oh shoot! Sorry. <laughs> Early on, there was there's a bad echo in the stream. I apologize. I didn't see that. Um, oh yes, and then Trevor says, "Place your questions in the Q and A." So I think if there are no further questions. Okay, great. Well, yeah. bit of business. You get. Uh... You get a star to take home and show you a daughter. Okay? How exciting. But yeah, I always say that it's one thing to get invited outside to give a talk, but if you're actually invited by your colleagues to give one here, you really hit the home. I very so much feel that. I really appreciate that. Yeah, Thank I you. I really enjoyed the talk. Thanks Excellent. so much. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening.